welcome, folks. It is uh, good to be here with you tonight. Uh, my name is Rory Baker. I'm a financial advisor uh, for Banker's Life here in town. And part of retirement planning, of course, is learning about our health expenses and what some of those risks are in our retirement. And so I thought we could spend a little time together tonight uh, going over what Medicare is. What are the four parts of Medicare? What are the changes coming up to Medicare in 2025? How that affects you, how that can affect your retirement? And just also spend some time going over uh, questions and answers towards the end. And uh, I'll keep my PowerPoint brief so that we can maximize our time for a question and answer at the end, okay? So tonight, we'll definitely talk about the four parts of Medicare, A, B, C, and D. We'll describe, describe what those are, what your options are for what Medicare doesn't cover, and then, of course, the Q&A. So let's dig in. Part A of Medicare, this covers the hospitalization. You can think of this as uh, inpatient. Part B covers your doctors. It covers uh, diagnostics. It covers labs. You can think of it as outpatient. Part C is Medicare Advantage. And then Part D, the part that changes every year, is for your prescription drugs. Now let's dig into Medicare Part A. There's no premium for Medicare Part A. People say that it's free, but that's what your FICA taxes have paid all those years. It does cover inpatient hospitalization. It also covers hospice care and skilled nursing uh, for certain periods. Benefit periods, um, Medicare breaks hospitalization up into benefit periods, and so if you go into the hospital, no matter if it's one day, five days, 40 days, up to 60 days, you would be responsible for a $1,632 deductible. That can happen up to five times per year. So imagine in January, you are foolishly out on some ice, <laughs> and you slip and fall, and you end up staying the night in the hospital, if in the fall you're cleaning your gutters and you slip and fall again, that would be a separate $1,600 deductible. The second benefit period, days 61 through 90, Medicare will pay all but $408 per day. Now, it's not common that people are in the hospital this long. And in fact, Medicare has a program called DRG, or Diagnose Related Groups. And what that is, they have a specific number of days you're supposed to be in the hospital for a certain type of injury. It's, it's pre-prescribed for you. So if you go into the hospital and you have an injury that is supposed to be three days, if you are in the hospital for four days, the hospital eats that cost because Medicare will only cover the three days. But if you're only in the hospital for two days, the hospital is able to reuse that bed again. So they're incentivized to, to, to get you out as early as possible. But if you are in the hospital for more than 60 days, Medicare will, will cover it all minus the $408 per day. Now, days 91 through 50, you only get these once in your life. It's a lifetime reserve, and according to Medicare. Medicare will cover all of that except $816 per day. Anything above 150, Medicare does not cover it, and you have 100% responsibility there. For skilled nursing, there are a couple of caveats here. In order for Medicare to pay for skilled nursing, it will pay for days one through 20. It'll pay 100% of the cost, provided you've been in the hospital for three days and you are getting better each day. If you need skilled nursing, which often happens after rehab or a surgery, uh, it's, gonna, it's gonna cover everything except $204 per day. If you're in skilled nursing longer than 100 days, Medicare pays nothing as that is deemed long-term care. I point out here that even though Medicare will cover up to 20 days, the national average right now is 18 days of coverage. Now, for Medicare Part B, those who are new to Medicare in 2024, you do get to pay a premium, and that premium for 2024 is $174.70 a month. This comes out of your Social Security if you are paying Social Security or if you're accepting Social Security. If you are not, then Medicare will bill you quarterly. You may be able to delay Part B of Medicare if you are still working, if you um, have creditable coverage. So if, you're, if your employer has a health plan, 
you would enroll in Part A, but you would defer Part B because you have health insurance through the company. And that way you're not paying that 174 per month since you already have creditable coverage. Part B does cover doctors and outpatient services like we had mentioned. It's a little unique in that it has a $240 annual deductible, a lot different from uh, what happened with Part A. You'll remember Part A had the deductible, but then it also had the copay per day during those benefit periods. When you're on Medicare, Medicare will cover 80% uh, of the doctor bill, and then you're responsible for the other 20%. There are certain doctors as part uh, in the early 90s, uh, a, a law was passed that allowed uh, some doctors to be able to charge an excess charge. And so that additional 15% that's not covered by Medicare, that is covered by you. And those doctors uh, tend to be specialists and they often have the word ologist at the end of their name or at the end of their title. Now we have looked at, at the cost of Part A and we've looked at the cost of Part B. And Folks that are enrolling in Medicare or who are enrolled in Medicare, they really have two options to be able to cover that 20% that, that Medicare is not covering. One of those is a Medigap policy. And then the other is Part C, known as Medicare Advantage. Now, Medicare Parts A and B are run by the government, and that's through CMS, the department CMS. However, if you choose to go to a Medicare Advantage plan that is not administered by CMS, that's administered by the private insured you get your Medicare Advantage plan from. So I just wanted to point out the two differences there for you. What it does is it takes place of your A and B. It wraps, it, wraps them together. You still have to pay your Part B premium, regardless if you go Medigap or if you go Medicare Advantage, you will pay your Part B premium. You keep your red, white, and blue Medicare card, but you don't need it. You would show your Medicare Advantage card whenever you get your prescriptions or whenever you see a doctor. Often, these Medicare Advantage plans uh, will offer additional benefits. Gym membership is one of them, uh, dental benefits, vision benefits, some hearing benefits. Uh, if you're diabetic, some of the plans will even send you healthy meals. There's uh, a tremendous amount of these, these, these benefits that that they offer. Each plan's a little bit different, uh, but they all offer something different. Um, one of the things they also cover is over-the-counter medications. You can get Band-Aids or vitamins or aspirin or a scale or a cane and those types of things um, as also one of those benefits of Medicare Advantage. I had mentioned earlier that the claims are processed through the coverage provider, not Medicare. And some of these Medicare Advantage plans, they, they cover prescriptions in addition to covering A and B. Now we get to Medicare Part D. This is your prescription plans. And now these plans vary according to the prescriptions that you take. They're all individual plans and they vary in cost based on what drugs you, you're on. They can be $0 per month or they can be as high as $120 plus per month if you have very specific medications. Most plans only require a copay or a coinsurance during the deductible period. And our prescriptions are broken down into tiers one through five. With tiers one and two, these are your generics. Tiers three, four, and five are your brand name drugs and the specialty drugs, especially as we get to tier four and to tier five. You can also imagine tier one is not as expensive as a tier five. Um, they all have a different copay, however. A tier one drug would have a different copay than a tier three drug, which would have a different copay or different coinsurance than a tier five drug. Now, I guess I should ask, does, does everyone understand the difference between a copay and coinsurance? I'm seeing some, some heads nodding back and forth. So imagine we, we, we show up to a pharmacy and we, we get a prescription, they say that's gonna be $1.10. And we go, well, how do we calculate that? Well, it's $1.10 for that drug every time, no matter what. That's a copay. A coinsurance is based on a percentage. It would be, say, 20% of whatever the drug cost is. And so if the drug fluctuates in price, your coinsurance is going to fluctuate in price because you're paying a percentage of it, whereas a copay is always the same. It's, it would be that same no matter what. Your tier four and five drugs uh, tend to be coinsurance, whereas your tiers one, two, three, 
tend to be a copay. It's not a hard written law, but it tends to work in that way. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed uh, has a major change coming in 2025 that I wanted to point out to everybody. It introduces a $2,000 cap on your medications. So if you do take expensive drugs, you will only have to pay up to the $2,000 in that year. Whenever that happened, uh, drug companies uh, were forced to raise their deductible. So this year, the deductible for Part D plans is gonna be $590. You are allowed to spread those payments over the 12 months. So if you are on really expensive drugs in January, you don't have to pay 2,000 and then nothing in February, you are able to, at the pharmacy, have that split across all 12 months to make that more reasonable for you. Now, some of the particulars about Part D, uh, some drugs do require physician approval before, uh, before you're able to get them. Also, some drugs have quantity limits. Typically, this falls into pain relieving drugs, especially opioids, in order to control those. Different plans cover different prescriptions. We call that a drug formulary. If insurer A has a drug formulary, it may be very different than insurer B and their drug formulary. With the rising, with the rising costs, we're starting to see these drug formularies uh, lean. They don't offer as many drugs in each plan as, as a cost-saving measure. So that's something that we're gonna see in 2025 as well. Now, sign up is voluntary. However, if you do not sign up for Part D, uh, you will be assessed a penalty whenever you do sign up for it. And so it's advised that even if you're not taking prescription medication, that you enroll in a Part D plan to avoid the fine that will come with it. Now, we had talked a little bit about skilled care earlier, and we had talked about how Medicare doesn't cover it past 100 days, as that is deemed long-term care. And in the Medicare and You Handbook that everyone gets every year, it's that big 150-page uh, book we get, there's a section in there that talks about long-term care how it's not covered, and that is the biggest gap that we have in Medicare. And so as a financial advisor and a retirement planner, part of my role is to make sure that you're informed that that is the biggest area for bankruptcy in retirement when, when folks need long-term care. And so be sure that you're educated and well-informed about your choices there. Now, how, how are people able to receive extended care or custodial care or long-term care. They're all three words that describe the same thing. Um, if you're receiving custodial care, there's no coverage under Medicare. Now, if you receive it in your home as home health care, there is limited coverage through Medicare. And so that's very important to look into. However, if you're at an assisted living facility or if you're at an adult daycare facility, there is no coverage for that. Just like the very first one, custodial care, uh, a nursing home, it doesn't cover it there. Um, when folks are at a nursing home, there are people that are there for skilled care. This is after surgery when they're in rehab. Uh, but Medicare, again, only covers up to those uh, that 20 days without a cost, and then up to 100 days where you have your copay, anything past that Medicare doesn't cover. And so to, to wrap up the, 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 the brief PowerPoint here on the parts of Medicare, uh, just want to reiterate, so Medicare's parts A and B, if you have a group plan, then you are able to defer your part B. You're able to cover the gap with a Medicare supplement plan or with a Medicare Advantage plan part C. Those are your options as you are turning 65 and become eligible for Medicare or if you have a disability, you can be on Medicare before the age of 65. For Part D, your options are, again, your employer group plan. They will provide your prescription coverage, or you enroll in a Part D prescription plan, or many Medicare Advantage plans have a prescription drug coverage that come with it. So with all of that said, that was me talking a whole lot real quick. So at this point, why don't we go ahead and open this up for some questions from you guys. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually roll out here so I'm not presenting behind a podium so we can have more of a conversation. How, Betsy, how will I know what the questions are from the audience? Okay, perfect. All right, 
So let's go ahead and open up the floor, um, just so I get to know who's in the room. Is everyone in here enrolled in Medicare, or is there someone who's T65 and or coming off of group insurance? You're coming off credible, creditable coverage. Okay, fantastic. And what are you guys? So I am on um, an advanced program right now. Okay. My wife is turning 65. Got it. Okay. Choice. So T65 and already enrolled. Fantastic. And how about you? Just looking for information. Well, you're in the right spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, fantastic. So let's let's start right here um, with the T65s. Uh, just because there's so much nuance around Medicare, much more than what was in the presentation. Go ahead and, and let me know what some of your questions are. I, I have the most complicated one. Okay. Um, maybe. 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 Um, I'm retired federal civil service employee. Uh -huh. So I carried into retirement uh, my federal employee um, health care. Yes. Which I pay $517 a month for. Yeah, Blue Cross. It's Blue Cross that I'm carrying, um, which is probably. You know, financial advisor probably advised me differently, but, but um, anyway, so I did that. You know, and then I um, enrolled in um, um, Blue Cross of Michigan Advantage program also. Okay. So, so I have this super coverage, and then also retired military. So Becky has had um, Tricare going into uh, this. Okay. Um, but now it has to Tricare automatically turns into Medicare program, so we have to make a choice. To do, and we have to make a choice on whether to go into Medicare for Becky or um, choose an Advantage program. Okay. I have a prescription program um, with my federal um, health insurance and with my Advantage program. Okay. So you're carrying both the federal coverage and the Advantage? And that's what I know people would tell me. Why are you doing such a thing? But I am. One of the reasons was because I'm afraid to drop it. Well, she was also on Tricare, so it was um, it was a transition period. Right. I could I could make choices. So you have Tricare for life as well. No. No. It no. no. no okay. I have Tricare, um, not Tricare for life. Okay. It, it converts to Medicare. So this this is the classic example of overinsured and. Um, what happens when we're in this situation, if we need medical care, you're going to be covered, but there's going to be this argument of who is going to cover it, who's primary, who's secondary, and in your case, tertiary. So it's, um, it's going to get really complicated if you ever need that care. And so I definitely think a simplified approach is going to be really important for you to do. That way you have a true understanding of what you have who's going to cover what, when it's going to cover, and what your costs are going to be. And that will help you uh, budget, and it will also make sure that you meet all of your talents and options that, that you're supposed to. Um, in terms of you, we're going to be losing TRICARE whenever we come on uh, to Medicare, and you'll have either the option of the Medicare Supplement or the Medicare Advantage plan. And the way this works, with the Medicare Supplement, there is a premium for it. Right? Every month there's a premium. So we're going to be paying the 174 for our Part B premium. And then for a female, the approximate cost is about $125 a month for a Medicare supplement plan. Right? So our cost is up here. But when you go to the doctor, no matter how many times you go, no matter how many surgeries you have, no matter what happens to you, you're paying $0 in terms of a deductible. If you get injured, have to go to physical therapy every single time, it's covered by your Medicare supplements. So you pay the premium, but you don't pay any co-pays or deductibles. With the Medicare Advantage plan, very low premium, but your co-pays and your deductibles are up here. And so you have to do this balance. It's just a teeter-totter. Both are good plans. Both make sense. You just have to be informed about what risks you have in each one. With the Medicare supplement, your risk is that you have high premiums. With Medicare Advantage, your risk is that you have high copays or high deductibles. It depends on how often you see your doctor. These are parts of the conversations that we have with folks that help them decide what makes the most sense and try to reduce their risk in the best way. Those are really good questions to start out with. Thank you. Anyone else have some questions? So what's your so I have a supplement of G. A G okay. What what's your opinion? Or I mean you just kind of said it depends on your situation, but 
you have a general opinion on a supplement versus all of these different advantage plans? And are they, and they're supposed to, I understand they're supposed to be changing or giving, you know, like they always say they're giving you all of this stuff. Is some of that's changing at the next year? Maybe it is. It is. With the $2,000 cap from the Inflation Reduction Act, 10% um, of the, uh, from the Carrier Humana, they took a look at, at their folks and said, all right, who, how many of us are, are needing help with prescription drug coverage and how many people will, will the $2,000 cap affect? And they determined it would affect 10% of the people that they have insured. So in order to cover that, the other 90%, their premiums are, are going up, their deductible is going up, and the drug formularies are leaning out in order to, to, to cover that extra cost. And so which one you go into when you turn 65, it, it, every person is different, and that's why we sit down and talk about it and go through what the finances are, what, what makes the most sense from a health perspective. Uh, one part that we didn't get into is that 174 is on a sliding scale of how much uh, income you have. And uh, it, it is based on your assets and your income. Generally, it's the 174 uh, for 2024, but there are other aspects of this more nuanced too. And so the additional benefits that you get, they are coming down a little bit. We already saw that with uh, the over-the-counter benefit that's coming down, uh, the dental benefits are tightening up, they're not covering as many procedures. Uh, for example, there are plans that have, they cover teeth cleaning and x-rays, a Medicare Advantage plan that covers teeth cleaning and x-rays, then they give you, I'm gonna just say $1,500 as a benefit. And you can use that benefit towards extraction, a crown. Uh, they, last year they added bridges, this year they're taking bridges away because of cost. And so everything's leaning down a little bit. And some of those costs and deductibles are going up. So is, it, is that stuff all published already? Is that out there if you want to know, you know, okay, I'm going to sign up for an advantage plan at the open enrollment. So is that all of that stuff available online now? For it is not quite yet. In fact, we're not even sure what the Part D premium is going to be and what the deductibles are going to change to in 2025. So all of the, the numbers that we just saw are 2024 numbers. And CMS has not released what that's going to look like for 2025 yet. Usually at this presentation, I'm updating people on what those changes are. Do we, is there a timeline or do we know when that's going to get published? Soon. <laughs> It, it to be before open enrollment. Probably. Well, it'll have to be before the annual enrollment period, right? right? And uh, when is that? Uh, the fifteenth of October through December seventh. That's the one time a year that you can make changes to your Medicare. You can change from a Medicare supplement to a Medicare Advantage. Right. Or you can go from a Medicare Advantage to a Medicare supplement if you don't qualify. Uh, you can change a Part D plan, and so on and so forth. So it's, that, that eight weeks is a is a really short eight weeks to make sure that people get any change that they need done. Did that fully answer your question? Okay. It, it, really, that was a lot of words to say, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> I have another question. Yes, sir. Um, Rebecca's birthday is uh, um, November 16th. So okay. you have three months before, three months after something to sign up. You have to sign up in this window when you first turn 65? Yes, okay. So what you're referring to is the initial enrollment period. Yes. Right? Yes. So we have AEP, that's the annual enrollment period. That's the October 15th through December 7th. And then we have our IEP, or our initial enrollment period. And it depends. Um, for a Medicare Advantage product, it is three months before, the month you turn, and three months after. However, for a Medicare supplement, it's six months before the month you turn and five months after. So imagine, imagine a scenario where someone signs up for a Medicare Advantage plan. Four months later, they decide, this is not working. I want to go to a Medicare supplement. Well, they can. They have one month left in order to be able to make that change because the initial enrollment period 
is five months after for a Medicare supplement. Great question. Do you know if TRICARE will stop at January 1st? Do you want to tell us something about that? So typically what happens with Medicare, it begins the first of the month that you turn 65, right? So any other coverage will end the day before that way there's no gap in the coverage. We have to sign up. But you have to sign up. And when you sign up, you, you, uh, you pick the date, right? And then whoever is helping you with this will also help you uh, make sure that your other coverage is uh, taken care of, that it, that it cancels on the day that it ends. Great question. So we should move before November 16th. We should move on this for quickly. Or, like well, quickly. We're, we're already in your initial enrollment period. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Several months, and so yes, I would definitely recommend sitting down with someone and going over what your options and what your entitlements are going to be. Absolutely. You're our first uh, well, avenue of doing this. Well, well, I appreciate you guys taking the time to be here. It it can be daunting to go through through that 152 page book that that they send you and trying to figure everything out. We were able to take most of that, condense it down to a few slides. There's more there, but those are the basics for you. How do you find somebody to sit down with? Well, I would recommend this guy named Rory Baker. <laughs> <laughs> you have a business card? <laughs> I do have a business card. Very good. I do have some business cards yeah, right up we'll here. Get one. And I have a sheet that uh, we, can, we can exchange contact information. All right. Perfect. Fantastic. Any, any other questions? Yes, Could you go into more detail, HMO versus PPO? Oh, absolutely. So these are different networks that we're talking about, right? And so an HMO network, um, they have a series of doctors that you have to see in order to receive care. Uh, one of the big things HMOs are known for are preventative care. And the way that they control the cost of that as well as making sure that your doctor is aware of what's happening, is you have to see your primary care physician before you see a specialist. That's different in most PPO uh, networks. You're able to go see a specialist without your prior, uh, without your primary care physician uh, referring you first. So there's a big difference there. Both of them are, are networks of doctors, but it's just their approach uh, that that they take. There are uh, Medicare Advantage plans that are HMO. And there are Medicare Advantage plans that are PPO. And so it's important to know um, if you're going to choose an HMO, you definitely want to make sure your doctor is a part of that network. And with any of the PPOs, they have they have in-network and out-of-network as well. But some of the Medicare Advantage plans in this area are uh, getting rid of their network. They have what's called a pass, <coughs> excuse me, a passive network. So whether the doctor's in or out of network, they pay the same anyway. So it, means that there's no network of doctors. And so that's a really exciting plan that has come out recently and making it where you can receive care wherever you want. And that's starting next year? That actually started um, uh, a year ago. Okay. Um, but it's really starting to catch on and, and people um, are choosing this plan. I'm not going to say any names here tonight because we're, we're doing the broadcast. Um, and I don't want to make it sound like I'm, I'm pushing a plan. Um, but a lot of people are moving into this plan because there's no network for this. And what would passive it Oh, I'll tell you when we're not. Yes. yes. A passive network. So is there yes. is there only one outfit doing that, or is there all in, in, doing in our county and in our area? There's only one outfit. Oh, doing that. And is that both an advantage and a So the HMO and the PPO is only for a Medicare Advantage plan. The Medicare supplement is completely different. There's no network of doctors. It travels to every state. As long as a doctor accepts Medicare, they will accept your Medicare supplement. Whenever an insurance company is going to roll out a Medicare supplement plan, and there's a million of organizations that do everything from, from a pastor's organization to the Shriners to you name it. There's tons of organizations that create Medicare supplement plans. But they're regulated by the government to make sure that if you get a plan G in Colorado, or if you get a plan G in uh, Michigan, 
those are the exact same coverage, right? So that way, as you travel from state to state to state, you know that that coverage is going to be exactly the same no matter where you go. So no network of doctors with a, with a, a Medicare supplement. There's no HMO or PPOs. Your, your plan is the same no matter where you go. Good question. I have another question. Please. If you go with the Medigap plan, can you still use your employer plan for your dental and vision? That depends on your employer. I do have clients that went on to a Medicare supplement in order to take advantage of the low co-pays and the low deductibles. And rather than getting a separate vision and dental plan, they use their employers. But it depends on the employer if they offer that. Okay. I don't want to get too far into the weeds here, but let's say oh, the, the wife is working at company A and the husband's retired and is receiving health benefits, including vision and dental, from the wife's employer plan, right? So we're, we're, we're now two layers, right? So you would, if the, if the husband is going to go on to Medicare and wants to get vision and dental, they would have to check with the employer to make sure the spouse is able to, to get vision and dental, whereas the wife may, the spouse may not. And so you really have to, to make sure that you're you understanding. You check with your that. benefits first and your yeah, get with your HR person and who does your benefits, and they'll be able to explain that. But that's all part of the exploration process. These are things that we talk about and make sure that there's not going to be any surprises. That's a really fantastic question. Yes, sir. So the Advantage plans are typically area um, specific, zip code specific almost, for PPOs or even HMOs or whatever. If you spend six months in Florida or something um, every year, uh, are there certain plans that cover? Oh, you know, you're saying but Medicare Advantage are national and they have a national network. You would just, if you're is that a different Florida, kind of plan though? I'm sorry, I missed that. If you, you know, you're, you're having an advantage plan, a PPO, and you, you've got your doctor network up here, but then you spend you know a few months somewhere else in the coverage. There's the network of doctors there as well. So let's let's say you have Carrier A, right? They're a nationwide company. So they have a network of doctors that's across the entire U.S. So if you travel out of Michigan, it's not as if you're going to be automatically out of the network. There will be in-network doctors in every state. You just have to make sure that you you know who they are as you get there. Do you have to gonna, switch your primary care doctor then if you're not for six months? That would be up to you. That would be absolutely up to you. It would do, you're going to have to claim residence in one state though, right? Usually you're getting your health care from the state that you claim as your residence and that's your primary care physician. Of course you're going to have someone that you see when you're in Florida, but there's a lot of people, especially in our area, that are on Medicare Advantage plans and then they get go to Florida for the winter and then they come back and it's seamless. There are concerns though with um, like Puerto Rico and foreign travel though. Yes, these plans only cover uh, domestic uh, travel. Now with that being said, if you are traveling, um, if you are traveling, it will cover emergency care. It won't cover hospital stays and going to see the doctor because you get a flu. But if you're if you're injured and you need emergency care, it will cover that. I like it. These are good questions. No, my federal employee insurance only gives me emergency care. Okay. Concern. Anyone? Do you recommend plans besides Priority Health? Because we went and saw somebody. I mean, do you talk about besides priority health? Because that's all the gentleman we saw wanted to discuss with us. Gotcha. Um, so, so are you knowledgeable and do you? I'm deciding if I want to say who I who I work with. I work with at least six different companies who offer Medicare Advantage plans. My approach with this is. You have a toolbox and there's a lot of tools in there. Sometimes you need a screwdriver and sometimes you need a wrench. Right. 
right? There are some Medicare Advantage plans that have a really great dental program. There's other Medicare Advantage plans that have a really low hospital copay. So we would match what your need is to the plan that you need. And I, I just have a different approach about it in that way. I think by having more carriers and knowing what each one is, I'm able to solve problems more acutely according to what the client's needs are. That's another really good question. Wow. Well, I wanted to know about others and all the, you know, all that you discussed was priority. Sure. And I know it's big up here. Yeah, I mean, there's the carriers in our area. Uh, for Grand Traverse County and, and the six county area around us, you have, of course, Priority Health, Blue Cross. I'm talking about Medicare Advantage plans at this point, these carriers. Um, uh, Humana, Aetna, United Health, WellCare. You know, there's, there's plenty of them around. And each of them have um, their own nuances to it and are able to. So we come to you and explain what medications we're on and. Um, yeah. Financially, yeah. and all that, and just you sit down for, to, for to steer us minutes. towards something that fits yeah. our. And then you just lay out the options. Usually, whenever I'm sitting down with someone, we'll have a conversation. We'll talk about health. We'll talk about goals. We'll talk about um, you know, your your situation and what you're trying to accomplish. And through that conversation, I'm already able to weed out several of them so that we don't have too many options. And so I can take several of them off the table and then present some options to you and then you get to choose. This is your health care, right? Uh, this isn't a, a time for sales. This is a time for you to be well educated so that you know that you're making a good decision about your health. And so you need options. And being able to look at an A and a B, then you're able to know about your health care from my perspective. If, if I was to go to um, Walgreens for a prescription that's filled, would they be able to tell me I think my two different insurances are covering a portion of it, and the other one picks up the rest of it. Would they be able to tell me which insurance is covering how much of it? Well, they're having to bill those insurances, so yeah, they're billing both. Yeah, yeah. Okay. they're they're. And I pay nothing. Them. Right. So, yeah. The, so I could go to the them and ask them. The pharmacy's billing them, and so they know exactly what amounts are coming from each from, from which of the two. Yes. That would be good information to have. Would be very good information. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyone else? We will do that. Oh, creditable coverage. Sure. So let's imagine that we're 64 years old, and in a few months, we're going to be turning 65. We're still working, and we have health insurance from our employer. And Wanting to, to know, should I go on Medicare or should I stay with my group insurance, right? And so the first thing that we do is we look at what are the premiums, right? What are you paying for your group coverage? What are your deductibles? And what have you spent on health on an annualized basis over the past several years? Have you been to a hospital? Have you taken an ambulance ride? All of these types of, of, of questions come up. And then we just simply do a cost analysis what makes the most sense for you. Sometimes it makes sense to stay with the group coverage. Sometimes it makes sense to go with Medicare. It all depends on the situation, who's providing the insurance and how much you're being charged for, for your group plan. And so uh, it would, it would, you would need to sit down and, and work out the math and see what makes the most sense. Yeah. Without designation of age to any of that. Okay, this is a fantastic question. More really great nuance. So if you have a health savings account with your employer, when you go on to Part A, you are no longer able to contribute to your HSA. You get to keep what was in your HSA and you can use that, but you're no longer able to put money into your HSA. So we're gonna use that same scenario. If we're 64 years old, in a couple of months, we're turning 65, we get our, our insurance through our employer and we have an HSA. When you turn 65, you're going to be enrolled in Medicare A, no matter what, right? It becomes, uh, it becomes the primary, and your group plan becomes the secondary. The Part B, we're going to defer it because we're going to stay with our group plan in this in this scenario, right? So we're not paying the 174 per month, 
but we're not able to contribute to the HSA anymore because once you go on to Part A, you're not able to contribute to that HSA. It automatically, so it automatically switches from the HSA to whatever the other plan is on the FHO or? Well, the health savings account is, think of it as, a, as just a, a little savings account that you can pull medical expenses out of and you were able to contribute to it with money before you're taxed. And so that money is still your money. It's still sitting in this little bucket over here and you can use it to pay uh, your medical expenses still, and um, but you're not able to put any more money into that bucket. So you have to tell your employer to stop putting money in there. But do you have to switch to the other plan? Because like, if I, maybe I'm not understanding, but if I got into an accident or something, or if I had to go to the doctor, I play, I pay all of it up front if I have an HSA. So instead, that doctor visit would come from plan A, or is it, or is our HSA switching to the other plan that, we'll, that we have? I, I think I understand what you're saying. So <laughs> let's let's make some distinctions. Your your HSA is a savings account. It's not health coverage whatsoever. And then you have your, in your case, group insurance, right? Mm -hmm. So if we were to have uh, an accident and we have a deductible, we can use our HSA to cover the deductible, right? For any expenses, everything's paid out of pocket, yeah. Right, any, any out of pocket expense. The same is true if you go on to Part A, defer Part B, and still have the group insurance plan. If you have any deductibles or any out of pocket expense, you can still use what's in your HSA to cover that. You just can't contribute any more money into it. You can't save it. But you still get to use it until it's exited. Does that fully answer your question? Kind of. <laughs> but what happens if you get, what if you don't have, you've depleted that, but you're still on HSA? Are you on, where does the money come from if you can't put anything more into it? So the, the HSA, you're funding that currently through through uh, either your employers putting money into it or you're doing <coughs> contributions to go into it. Those contributions stop. So, so then we would automatically go to the other plan that we have where we don't have those HSA is not a health plan. It's just a savings account, and so you have you have to do what? We have to choose. We have to choose which one. Right. You have to choose whether to have out of pocket or to have the HSA cover, right? We have to choose if we want if an you HSA. Want the HSA or the HMO. HMO. That's what we choose to pay the out of pocket expense. The health savings account is not medical coverage. But the plans are like different. Right. Right, you have different options. So let's say you have a plan and it has an HSA, it would have different options than another plan that does not have an HSA. So your employer may offer different options. One may have an HSA with it, but the HSA is, is not coverage. It's just money put aside. And so... Right. Yeah. Which I get that. Coverage is a little bit easier. The coverage, yeah. the coverage is different from the plan that has an HSA and the plan that doesn't have an HSA, certainly. And uh, in different employers, some people contribute to the HSA, the employer does, and sometimes the employee does. They're all different types of plans, but the actual medical coverage itself, even though it may be different from a plan with an HSA, different from a plan without it, the HSA still is just a savings account to help pay for co-pays and deductibles. So if you're on an HS, if your plan has an HSA, great, that's a good way for us to lower our taxable income and then use that later down the road for our health care. That HSA remains in place. If you're participating in one, it stays in place. Regardless if you go on to Medicare Part A, you still have access to that money that you put into. That coverage would be the secondary to Medicare Part A, correct? Yep. So the out of pocket, the deductible and the maximum out of pocket are different for the HSA plan than they are for the HMO plan. Correct. So if you no longer contribute to the HSA, does it turn over 
I mean, I guess that's that's how we're thinking of it, right? If, if you don't have the HSA, then you're into the H, HFO, or does your still have you, the same you coverage? You don't contribute. HSA. You still you, have the same have the deducts same and stuff. You just don't contribute to the HSA. Okay, so then, right? So then, when that comes around again, you could still we would opt have to, for the HSA and not put talk, any money into it. And we would have to talk to your human resources person to know what the employer requires of an employee if they're not going to participate in the HSA. And this is this is such a unique situation. Well, it's not unique. There's more than one person that has it. It's a very nuanced situation, and this is where we would need to do additional research to make sure that we're picking the right plans for you. And um, those types of questions, this is why we have the conversation. Those types of questions pop up. We need to find out those answers before we make any moves to make sure that you're, you're putting yourself in the best financial position. I don't know about your particular employer, so we'd have to ask. Right, yeah. Understood. Great questions. I have a question then about HSA. I have a HSA account that I put money into. I can no longer put money into it, mm -hmm. but it's sitting there. Can I use that to pay for um, premiums? You can um, use it to pay your Part B premium, okay. but you cannot use it to pay for a Medicare Advantage or a Medicare supplement. Okay. Okay, so I couldn't pay 123 or whatever you said was average for 60. Correct. Six year old woman. Correct. I couldn't pay that premium with my HSA. You could not, but you could pay your Part B deductible. Right. Right? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I kind of thought I could pay for that when I reached retirement, you know. Sure. But I know I heard from one person I could, another person said I couldn't, so I wasn't sure what, which one to go with. <laughs> Absolutely. I wish I would have put more into it. I <laughs> will say that. Everyone says that later. Because I didn't know once you hit 65, you couldn't contribute anymore. You know, another so. thing, another nuance that, that we should talk about is that in the state of Michigan, whenever you're turning 65 and you get a Medicare supplement, it will cost a specific amount. The next year, it's going to be a little bit more expensive. The next year, it's going to be a little bit more expensive. The next year, it's going to be a little bit more expensive. There's a rate change every year that you're on it. In Florida, that's not the way they do it. You have one price that you pay the entire time you have. It just so happens to be that it's really expensive, right? So Michigan looks at it as when you're 65, you're not going to use as much health care as you do when you're 85. So it progressive as it goes along. Whereas Florida goes, all right, we're all going to pay one price. It just happens to be the expensive price. And so um, every state has their own way of doing it. But in Michigan, just know that your, your plan will change every year. All right. Well, I think we have covered quite a bit here. Um, if there's no other questions, uh, uh, feel free to come up and ask me some specific questions, especially product specific questions if you wish, and uh, we'll exchange some contact information if that's I basically better. came in here thinking there was some work for us to do, and I'm leaving here thinking there's some work for us to do. <laughs> <laughs> there is some work to do. <laughs> I'm glad we met your expectations. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm, I'm going to go have the recording turned off, and then we can we can continue the chit chat for a little bit longer. I was going to just say, if you're planning on having a meeting at the Social Security office, they're not going to talk to you right away. You're going to have to make an appointment, and it could take weeks before you can actually sit down and talk to somebody. Thank you. And, Thank you. So you know, don't wait yep. till the last minute because. She, we just did the same thing to okay. set up a meeting. Thought we could just and walk in. And they only in. do it by phone. They don't do it in person anymore, Steve. And I, I wanted to say, Rory, I'll thank, be, thank right you so much. Oh, thank absolutely. You. So, okay.